In the past, storms, eclipses, earthquakes, and other inexplicable phenomena were attributed to God or gods. However, as our knowledge of the natural has grown, so the dominion of the supernatural has been pushed back. With no other way to explain them, it's reasonable that feelings of love, hope, joy, power, significance, and transcendence experienced in a religious context might be attributed to God. But what if there's a natural experience that feels just as one might expect an encounter with God to feel? What if there's a process that reliably elicits this experience in most people? And perhaps most importantly, what if Christianity, whether intentionally or not, makes use of this very process? I'm John Hunter, and for more than 20 years, I've been looking into these questions. Religious experiences, and by that I mean experiences that feel like encounters with God or the Holy Spirit, form the foundation of belief for millions of people around the world. If you ask a friend who's a Christian what their conversion story is if they weren't a Christian all their life, it's incredibly rare that you find somebody saying that they read a particular argument and they, they, just, they just suddenly dropped to their knees. Rather, it's usually something more experiential. Maybe the arguments that they're reading inform something that they've experienced, or maybe they have an experience that is informed by things that they've read, sure, but it's the experience, it's that feeling that, that actually causes somebody to convert. Alex O'Connor is, of course, a renowned non-believer, but analytical philosopher and Christian apologist Dr. William Lane Craig, who you may know from his debates with Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, and others, says very much the same thing. I think that the fundamental way in which we know Christianity is true is through the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. I do not think that arguments and evidence are necessary in order for faith to be rational or for you to know that God exists and has revealed himself in Christ. It's so nice to see believers and non-believers agreeing on something. My interest in the topic began in London in 2003 when I had an experience that at the time I was certain was a profound encounter with God. Describing a religious experience is not like describing a red toolbox you'd like someone else to find in another room. You can't provide objective dimensions, angles, colors, texture, or mass. What I can say about the experience is that I was filled with a sense of love, hope, joy, power, significance, and transcendence, as much as these words can capture the ineffable. I was overcome with emotion. I was crying shamelessly. My cheeks and neck and shirt quickly became wet with tears. And as I was having this experience, I simply knew that God was real. In fact, when Dr. Craig describes his own conversion experience and his profound encounter with God, he could easily have been describing mine. Out to him, and I felt this tremendous infusion of joy filling me. It was almost as though I was a balloon being blown up until it was ready to burst. I, and I just began to cry all of the tears of uh, bitterness and anger that had built up inside of me just came flooding out and this tremendous joy came flooding in. I rushed outside, it was a warm September evening, and I could see the Milky Way uh, stretching from horizon to horizon. I looked up at the stars and I thought, God, I've come to know God. And that moment was a turning point in my life. My experience was so compelling, so convincing, so real, that I quit my job and began working for the church. For months, I was on a spiritual high, but three months after the encounter, I sank into the most agonizing depression of my life. It turns out that what I'd been through was not a religious experience. It was a manic episode. This is the elevated side of the bipolar disorder mood spectrum. And so I wondered, if I could be fooled by a natural experience like this, could other people be fooled by similar natural experiences? In just the last five or so years, researchers found that people with bipolar disorder often interpret hypomania and mania as religious experiences, so other people can be fooled by these natural states. However, bipolar disorder only affects about 1-2% to of the population, so my initial thoughts were that mania could possibly explain some religious experiences among people with the disorder, but that it didn't have much relevance for anyone else. After being lucky enough to experience mania in 2003, at least from the perspective of understanding certain religious experiences, I was lucky enough to endure 
psychologically abusive form of personal development seminar known as a large group awareness training or LGAT in 2010. It was through my participation in the seminar that I first realized that practically anyone will experience hypermanic or manic symptoms if exposed to established triggers of bipolar disorder in a controlled environment. These seminars promise participants a powerful experience they refer to as a transformation. And to achieve this transformation, they put people through days of psychological stress, using exercises and interactions to generate high levels of guilt, shame, inadequacy, uncertainty, and fear. Because you're so stupid. You don't even know why you're here. Because some of you are so stupid. I pushed the right button. Don't worry. I'll get the same response every time. And then, on the final day when participants graduate, the stress is removed and replaced with love, acceptance, affirmation, and renewal. After my diagnosis in 2003 to better manage the condition, I'd learned that key triggers of hypomania and mania are psychological stress and goal attainment. Algats have these triggers in spades. At the end of the Algats, I also noticed that the indicators of what they call transformation lined up perfectly with the symptoms of hypomania and mania. This observation formed the foundation of my PhD research. Millions of people from around the world have participated in LGATs, and the vast majority experience this transformation. In other words, you can put people through a natural process, one that doesn't involve drugs, and reliably elicit hypermanic and manic-like states in most people. If these subjective states might reasonably be confused with a religious experience, then, if religions employ a similar process, they might be able to manufacture religious experiences at strategic times. In my dissertation, in addition to providing evidence for this observation, I put forward a neurobiological explanation for the relationship between psychological suffering, social reward, and these transformative experiences. While I briefly applied this explanation to Christianity, my thinking is more refined and detailed in my book, Manufacturing Mania. To summarize some of the key ideas, there's compelling evidence that elevated dopamine signaling contributes significantly to hypomania and mania. There's other research that shows that psychological stress followed by reward plausibly results in elevated dopamine activity. And these rewards would include social rewards like love, forgiveness, affirmation, renewal, and a sense of community. LGATs use a process of psychological suffering followed by social reward and they elicit transformations with indicators that align with hypermania and mania, or stated differently, elevated dopamine signaling. Importantly, LGATs occur in a secular environment and participants are primed to anticipate transformations rather than hypermania or mania, as might occur in a clinical setting, or religious experience, as would occur in a religious context. Remember though that the feelings elicited through elevated dopamine activity are not like a red toolbox, and that the same subjective experience with the right priming and in the right context might be interpreted as a religious experience. In fact, a substantial body of evidence has started to emerge from pharmacological studies, research into mental disorders, and more recently, functional brain imaging, that elevated dopamine signaling plays an important role in at least some religious experiences. As just one example, an fMRI study was conducted on devout Mormons in 2018, and it found that the nucleus accumbens, a key target of dopamine in the mesolimbic pathway, became activated a few seconds before participants reported peak spiritual feelings. So, there's evidence that hypomania and mania, which are associated with elevated dopamine signaling, are not infrequently interpreted as religious experiences, and there's independent evidence that elevated dopamine signaling is associated with certain religious experiences. There's also evidence that psychological suffering followed abruptly by social reward elicits elevated dopamine activity in most people. But I'd like to add to this with an explanation as to why dopamine activity might rise when we feel psychologically threatened. This is what I call the dopaminergic defense hypothesis, 
The basic idea here is that our brains have evolved to seek homeostasis or equilibrium. Guilt, shame, inadequacy, uncertainty, and fear represent psychological disequilibrium. And dopamine elevation provides a useful internal defense against the psychological disequilibrium. Think of drugs like cocaine and methamphetamine, which elevate dopamine activity and elicit feelings of boldness, power, joy, energy, motivation, and optimism. These are useful feelings when you're psychologically threatened. So we have this process of psychological suffering followed by social reward that appears to cause experiences that might reasonably be interpreted as religious experiences. The final question then is, does Christianity make use of this process? I don't think it takes much imagination to recognize that the gospel or good news essentially employs this exact process. While there are many denominations within Christianity, most claim that we're sinners and that only through Christ can we be saved. I could run through numerous verses that argue that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that no one is worthy, and that even our righteous acts are like filthy rags. But it's evident that, according to the Bible, if we were not sinners, there would be no need for Jesus' sacrifice. We're asked to confess our sins and seek forgiveness. This is how a person becomes a Christian, and if we don't, we'll spend an eternity suffering. Most people want to be good and recognize how far short they fall of the standards that Christianity sets for us. For anyone who takes these passages seriously and who meditates upon them with any real earnestness, feelings of guilt, shame, inadequacy, uncertainty, and fear, or psychological suffering, may be overwhelming. Then Christianity facilitates the removal of the suffering and its replacement with love, acceptance, forgiveness, renewal, and reconciliation with God. This is a clear case of psychological suffering followed by social reward, a process that it's been argued results in an experience that, with the right priming and in the right context, may reasonably be interpreted as a religious experience. We know that this experience of elevated dopamine activity might be interpreted in different ways, in different contexts. So then we must ask, are Christians primed to expect a religious experience or an experience of the Holy Spirit when they convert and receive forgiveness? In addition to the fact that the experience would occur in a religious context, they are specifically told to anticipate a religious experience at this time. I'd like to make it clear that this doesn't mean that authentic religious experiences don't exist, only that this process of psychological suffering followed by social reward by inviting God into your life provides a plausible natural explanation for some religious experiences. We can't get into the minds of every person prior to their conversions, and so we don't know if they experience some sort of significant psychological stress before giving their lives to God. Dr. Craig does, however, provide us with this insight. He explains exactly how he felt in the months leading up to his conversion. I did, and I realized that I too was inauthentic. I was a hypocrite. And so that hatred turned in on myself for my own phoniness and hypocrisy. And I don't know if you understand what this is like, but this kind of inner anger just eats away at your insides, day after day, making every day miserable. Another day to get through. He's also explained that when he sought forgiveness and invited God into his life, he experienced what he was certain was an experience of God. And basically, uh, at the end of this six months, I simply uh, cried out to God to... uh, come into my life and I just cried out to him and I felt this tremendous infusion of joy filling me. Perhaps some people are just better at distinguishing between genuine religious experiences and experiences that simply feel like encounters with God. But having gone through a natural religious experience myself and having felt how compelling they can be, it seems possible that many claimed encounters with God can be naturally accounted for. If you'd like to support me in creating more of these types of videos, you can do so by donating to the channel through our Patreon page. This will also give you early access to videos and channel updates. 
You will also get access to our Discord server, where you can participate in discussions and debates with other members of our community. You can check it out by clicking the link in the video description.